Hi, I'm Tom Gilson, Associate Editor with Against the Grain, and I'm here at the Charleston Conference in the penthouse suites of the Francis Marion Hotel. And I'm here with Jack Montgomery, who's the Head of Collection Development at Western Kentucky University. And we're here to talk to Eric Hellman, who is the President of Glue Jar. Eric, welcome to the penthouse. Thank you. It's great to have you here. We're delighted that you're able to make some time in your schedule to talk to us. I always enjoy coming to Charleston. That's great. That's great. Uh, for those folks out there who might not be familiar with your company, Glue Jar, can you tell us what Glue Jar is all about? Well, uh, Glue Jar is just the name of the company. We're, all of our effort right now is focused on the website Ungluit, unglue.it. Uh, Glue Jar, the name Glue Jar actually dates back six years. Uh, and it's actually the same company uh, that I had before, Openly Informatics. Uh, and uh, when OCLC uh, bought that company, they didn't actually buy the company. They uh, bought the assets, the business, the customers, the employees, and the name. So I had to get my, uh, I had a, needed a new name for the company that was just going to sit around and not do anything for a while. And uh, my 12-year-old son at the time, helped me pick the name. So uh, he was uh, uh, my naming consultant who turned out to be very expensive. He's now a, a freshman at USC. <laughs> so he's making you pay for it, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was interested to see on the website that, that your background is in physics research. And I'm wondering, how did you make the transition into being interested in libraries and information technology? Well, I worked at Bell Labs for 10 years on semiconductor physics. I, I grew thin film epitaxial crystals of oxides and, and superconductors and nitrides. And uh, when uh, I started a new field of research growing nitrides in, I think, uh, 94, and uh, I, me and, and some colleagues thought that the, that the field needed a, a new journal to, to rapidly disseminate the, the results in the field. And so we started, uh, in cooperation with the Materials Research Society, we started an, a, a, an electronic journal that was open access and uh, ahead of its time. And uh, I built all the software to, to do everything, to run the journal, and uh, because I didn't know it was impossible. <laughs> and at a certain point, I, I, I uh, realized I was having more fun uh, doing electronic publishing uh, than I was at my day job. And I thought, you know, what, what's, what's more important than, than you know, helping research uh, be communicated? And, and uh, so I decided to, to quit Bell Labs and start my own company. Eric, I noticed on your website that a big part of what your vision is, is, and I'll quote you, to liberate specific ebooks and other types of digital content. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? We want to find a way to, to make ebooks uh, free to the world in a way that compensates the people who produce the books. And so our model is very similar to the way public broadcasting works in the U.S. Um, it, both radio programs and, and books cost a lot to make. Uh, the, you know, an e-book or a book might, you know, involve a year of an author's life. And, uh, you know, editors and, and graphic artists and layout designers and proofreaders. And... Um, but if you count the, the distribution that's made possible by libraries, you can distribute a book at zero cost um, uh, to any number of, of users. So if you can find a way to, to uh, cover the, the cost of producing the book plus whatever profit the, the, uh, the, the publisher needs, then you can make the book free to everybody. And I thought that was an important thing to do, even if it's a you know, small number of books where you can do that with, it's still worthwhile. So that's what we're trying to do. And, and the role of libraries you would see is primarily um, distribution? Uh, uh, 
Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, in a world where there is an excess of information, uh, the role of a library has to shift from collecting and managing an inventory of a scarce good, like, like uh, print books are, to figuring out how to manage a deluge of information. You have uh, not scarcity, you have abundance. Mm -hmm. And so uh, people need help managing uh, or you know, finding the information they need and you know, knowing what resources are, are going to answer their questions, meet their needs. And so the, the, the phrase I've been repeating is uh, libraries need to shift from being collectors to being connectors. And it's interesting because cause the, you know, when I was doing linking, I was doing connecting. Mm -hmm. And so this is sort of more of, a, of an evolution to, to what people need to be connected to. So what it seems to me you're describing is, is a f another form of outreach from libraries, sort of reaching out to the author community to bring them into a, an opportunity that they may not have had otherwise. Is that well, you know, libraries are community builders mm -hmm. and they serve communities. Libraries are defined by the community they serve, whether it's uh, an academic community uh, or a... Uh, a town or a state and you know some libraries are archives and their community is sort of the future mm -hmm. so so that I, you know, I think the, the you can't separate a library from its community uh, you can separate Google and Amazon from you know the communities they have no community sure. at all and so even if if you know all the information you know comes from Google um, there's the lacking the community aspects that, that, that are, are the core of what, what uh, libraries are. Eric, um, I noticed that crowdfunding seems to be a key element of what you all are doing. Can you explain what that is and how it works? Yeah, crowdfunding is uh, very hot these days. Uh, Kickstarter is the biggest crowdfunding site in the world, and recently they've been coming up with million dollar successful campaigns every week and uh, so, so you know people see that as a viable source for you know doing interesting things uh, so we built our own crowdfunding platform and the the essence of crowdfunding is that if you get a lot of people who feel the same way about a particular project each of them can contribute a small amount of money and make things happen in by aggregating their funds. Um, typically, and this is what we do, uh, a crowdfunding campaign will have a goal, uh, say $10,000 or something like that, and people pledge towards the goal, and if once the, the, uh, the goal is reached, then the, the, uh, the, the project sponsor is committed to do something and people's credit cards are not charged until the end of the campaign. Mm. Uh, so you don't have the risk of you know, putting money into something that's not going to fly. Mm. Uh, we feel that it's important to focus, uh, uh, have a books focus, because there's lots of complications uh, with books, and we want uh, supporters of, of book projects to, be, uh, to have confidence in uh, that they will actually get a book and that the book will be of good technical quality and clear rights. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do. I have to ask this, as the businessman part of me uh, has to know, how do you make money from this? So, so uh, what, w like, just like Kickstarter, <clears throat> we take a percentage of successful campaigns. So our percentage is 6%. So if the, the campaign is, uh, say, $10,000, uh, our fee would be $600. Uh, our payment providers typically take about 4%, uh, and the rest goes to the rights holders. The rights holders are responsible for producing the ebook file 
and uh, we check that it's of good quality, and if it's not, they've got to fix it. Yeah. Earlier we were talking, and I, I mentioned that when I first looked at your website, I noticed that the name of the company was Glue Jar, but it seems that the service you're providing is called Unglue It. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, we uh, spent a while trying to figure out a good name for this because it's sort of a new process and most people aren't familiar with it. And uh, so we, we thought of a number of bad names. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, we, we thought of using uh, the word glue from uh, the, the name of the company and fortuitously it turned out that uh, unglue it, unglue.it sort of worked because uh, we, that, that stickiness, that idea of books being stuck mm -hmm. in copyright and in, you know, tied to platforms and things like that, uh, we could dissolve that glue with crowdfunding dollars and make the books unglued, free to the world. Um, you know, we wanted to, to, to pick a word that did not have any previous connotations. I mean, we thought of unlocked, but that implies that things are locked, or we thought of a liberation, but, you know, that, so unglue, the, the, using the verb unglue uh, has really worked well, and so we have ungluers who are the supporters on our site. <laughs> Uh, the whole process is ungluing, and once we're done, we have unglued editions. I know you spoke yesterday in the, the Curating a New World of Publishing session, and uh, what was the most important thing you feel like you told the audience in that well, session? Well, I was very happy to be on the session, um, and I think that, that the most important thing is to make a lot of people aware of what we're doing. I think. Uh, the large majority of the people in the audience had no awareness of what we were doing. And our constant battle, struggle, is to be more widely known so that we can reach all the people who might be interested in supporting a particular book. What was the most important thing you learned from the other folks who spoke? Well, I was kind of nervous and, <laughs> you know, I had trouble, you know, paying attention. And, and I, I've... I, know uh, smash words very well uh, so I, I you know sort of already knew what what smash words is doing um, and I was not aware of what uh, what the pit library was doing and so I was very interested to, to see what they were doing and I think that just gave a flavor for how broad this movement uh, towards open access books is I noticed that um as, I, as you spoke earlier about copyright, and I wonder, is, does copyright pose any issues for you? Well, so we are focused on books that are in copyright because books that are out of copyright are already unglued. They don't, they don't need ungluing. Um, they belong to all of us. Uh, books that are in copyright, uh, we have to work with the rights holders uh, to... to to be able to do this without infringing on copyright. Uh, so uh, the, the issues where things get sticky or where, where uh, components of the book may not, be, not have clear rights. So for example, uh, the cover, cover photo of a book is typically not owned by the author, but rather the publisher. And so when there's a rights reversion, uh, the, the rights to the cover are not reverted along with the rights to the text, so we have to produce a new cover. Uh, books with photographs may have photographs that have been rights cleared for use in a book, but uh, may not be cleared for use in certain kinds of licensing situations. So that turns out to limit the number of licenses that the, the, the uh, ungluing rights holder is allowed to use. What, what role does, say, you can't get the cover for the book, uh, what role would Unglue It play in that process? Would you help redesign or...? So, as I said, the rights holder is responsible for uh, all costs in producing the e-book once, mm. once a, a campaign is done. 
uh, what we do is we make sure that the rights holder understands that they have to have rights to all the components of the book. Uh, we, our role is not really as a publisher or as a gatekeeper, but we do want to make sure that we don't end up with a uh, unglued book that is, doesn't really have all the rights mm -hmm. needed to make it unglued. That was something else I noticed that you had you'd said that you're really not a publisher, but that you're dedicated to licensing works to the public commons. Could you talk a little bit about that? What, what exactly that, does that mean? Um, so the pub, well, we use Creative Commons licenses for all the books. The rights holder gets to choose which of the Creative Commons licenses uh, they want to use. Uh, uh, Sorry, I blanked out. This, okay. What did it's, so, it's the just, licensing? I'm I'm confused about how does the licensing in the Creative Commons work? Uh, right, right. Okay, so start over. <clears throat> so we use Creative Commons licenses. Uh, the rights holder gets to choose which of the Creative Commons licenses uh, they're they're willing to offer. Uh, the way a Creative Commons license works is that uh, uh, the copyright is still retained by the rights holder. They don't sell us the copyright. They actually uh, convey a license uh, to us. And the Creative Commons license then allows us to convey the license to uh, other people, who can then convey the license to other people. So it allows a peer-to-peer -peer distribution model. Uh, so we make sure that the, the, uh, the, the ebook file is deposited into Internet Archive, and so we convey the license to Internet Archive, and anyone downloading the file from Internet Archive then is conveyed the Creative, license, Creative Commons license as well. And they can then redistribute the book uh, under the terms of the same license. Eric, I noticed that Amazon stopped processing pledge payments for Unglued back in August. That's right. What happened? What, what was that all about? Well, yeah, it, it's, it's an interesting story, I can say, <laughs> having lived through it. Uh, but, uh, and I've learned so much about, uh, uh, you know, payments and credit cards that I never really wanted to know. <laughs> uh, so we were using Amazon Payments uh, to process credit cards and to collect money. And in August... I got this strange email that said, uh, you know, you're not approved for using uh, Amazon Payments. And I had an Amazon Payments account from, you know, three years before, so we've just been using that. And uh, I thought it was a phishing attack. They were trying to get my password or something. But it turned out it was real. And when I finally was able to speak with a person at Amazon Payments, uh, they told me that uh, Amazon Payments had decided to stop approving new uh, crowdfunding businesses. But they hadn't told anybody. Uh, and apparently, we sort of fell through the cracks because we had a pre-existing uh, business account. I've, I've had an uh, Amazon business account since, like, yeah, it must be 10, 15 years now. Mm -hmm. um, so... Uh, they said, sorry, but, uh, you know, we've decided not to do it. We're up to our ears in Kickstarter, and we haven't quite figured out how to do uh, all the, all the uh, compliance issues that uh, they face and are required to do by their regulated status in the state of Washington and their contractual requirements with their credit card processors, their networks. And so we're not going to do crowdfunding. So you got to stop. So we had to shut down. And uh, of course, the, the, the silver lining to this cloud was that it got us a lot of publicity because a lot of people hate Amazon <laughs> and assumed that uh, Amazon had shut us down because this little company was threatening their business of selling books. And uh, while I wish that were true, <laughs> you know, I, it, mm -hmm. it, it, I, it, the uh, real issues are involved with, you know, things like money laundering and, and uh, 
preventing terrorism and 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 weapons trafficking and stuff like that. And it's not likely that that you know that's going to happen with a book site. <laughs> But uh, you know they, they had made this decision and were not able to go back on it. So we were stuck. And I became a celebrity among the, all the, the, the startups in California doing, aiming to, to shoot down PayPal and Amazon. So I went around and discovered you know, three really great startups and you know, met all the CEOs and stuff. And, and we uh, ended up, you know, they, they were all really good and much easier to develop with. And uh, we end up choosing Stripe. And so far, we've been very happy with that. Okay. Yep. Oh, and the, the, the publicity netted us almost a doubling of the number of people really? who had signed up to our site. So we have about a 1,000 ungluers thanks to Amazon. Yeah, Amazon did you a favor. Sort Unintent of. Unintentionally. Yeah. Unintentionally, yeah. unintentionally yeah. they did us a favor, I think, in the long run. Where does unglue it go from here? Well, we have a big mountain to scale. Uh, we need to, you know, we have, we have about 2,500 ungluers right now, uh, which sounds like a lot, but it's sort of 1% of what we need to, to really be a viable community that's, that is supporting uh, Creative Commons eBooks. And uh, so we need, we need to grow. We need to get a lot more books. Uh, we only have five campaigns right now, and we've only unglued one book. Uh, and while that is a very good book, uh, and I have read most of it, uh, <clears throat> you know, there are millions of books out there that are still stuck, and we would like to unstick them. Are your ungluers mostly individuals, or are there organizations starting to jump in and uh, well, so there are many organizations that would like to step in, but they tend to act slower than individuals. And so in our first successful campaign, uh, we had 257 individuals that contributed and two libraries, both in Canada. Hmm. So, so, you, so you actually had libraries contributing? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And, you know, we'd like to increase that because, uh, you know, libraries are everywhere and, and their, their goals are aligned with ours. Well, how would you then suggest a library become involved with Unglue It? Well, the other side of that coin is that, that uh, libraries are, present unintentional barriers to the distribution of free ebooks. Their, they, their processes often build in the assumption that they have to buy copies. And with free ebooks, they don't have to buy copies. They just have to make it available. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I talk about, you know, the tragedy uh, that could occur if some student comes in and their class is reading Moby Dick and they need a copy and all the print copies mm -hmm. are checked out and, and, and the library you know, might tell them that no, they don't have Moby Dick available as an ebook. Mm -hmm. And Moby Dick is in the public domain. It belongs to all of us. Mm -hmm. And the 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 ebook version in Project Gutenberg is free and it's a very good quality. Mm -hmm. So as I said, the library has to be a connector. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so much crap out there mm -hmm. that that, you know, it's sometimes hard to find you know, the really good stuff. And, you know, with free books, there's no motiv motivation, no financial motivation for the distributors to, 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 to make it free. And so that's what the libraries need to, to be thinking about. So my answer is, yes, we'd like you to, con like libraries, to contribute to campaigns where the, the, the book is relevant to them. But we'd also want libraries to start thinking about how to uh, meet user needs with the the free ebooks that are available, both Creative Commons and public domain. So you see libraries possibly integrating that content into their discovery systems? Is that yeah, definitely. We've been talking to a lot of uh, like e library platform vendors, uh, library uh, discovery systems, um, 
and we've made an effort to make sure that uh, catalog records are made for the 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 books that we unglue, uh, and uh, you know, oftentimes there's a problem because uh, the the the, the ebook platforms uh, assume that that there will be DRM. They assume that that uh, the, the books are you know single copy use. Right. And so th you know I've I know most of the platform vendors from my time uh, with OCLC and with Open, Openly Informatics, and they are very eager to make this possible mm -hmm. to to be able to put the free ebooks. That libraries want alongside the the, the books that they've purchased, and uh, but they just haven't done it yet, mm -hmm. and so you know it'll it'll be a while before uh, it's as easy for a library to purchase a free book mm -hmm. as it is to purchase a book that's on sale, mm -hmm. um, but we're not there yet. Do you, do you see any sort of role for uh, many libraries have developed institutional repositories? Do mm -hmm. you see any sort of role for Ungluit and uh, this kind of relationship? Uh, well, certainly, uh, a, an unglued ebook can be put into a repository, and and that might sort of be a back door into the discovery systems of a library. I, Eric, before we let you go, I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> oh boy! Well, it's 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 not that bad. Uh, we've been firing a lot of questions at you, but if you were in Jack and Molly's chair, what question would you ask yourself? Uh, I'd ask, you know, uh, something about my uh, mental stability. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Are you totally crazy, or you know, do you really think this will work? You know, and and you know, my answer is yeah, I think it'll work. I don't. Th I think it'll take longer than I expect, uh, but it'll it'll take a while. But I do think it'll work, and and the reason I think it'll work is because uh, the relationships that people have with books is different than than practically any other sort of consumer mm -hmm. product. Uh, I, I, I have friends who, who are real book people, and and their houses are filled with books stacked on shelves that cover all the walls, mm -hmm. you know, three deep. <laughs> and and having uh, moved in and out of my house recently, you know, I'm very aware of like how many books I have and and how inconvenient they are. But like. Have you ever tried to throw away one of your books? Mm. Like, yeah. you, you can't do it. Yeah. And the reason is it's because once you've read a book, it's like your friend. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, you, you, can't really, you can't really throw a friend into the dumpster, you know? <laughs> uh, and, and so the, there's sort of that, that love of books. And, and, you know, people, you know, the same person who would never, you know, get rid of their book would happily lend it to a friend or even give it to a friend right. because there you know you're 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 taking a book and 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 letting it live some more mm -hmm. and uh, so and that's sure. what we're trying to do we're trying to make the books live some more okay eric i want to thank you very much this has been uh, not only informative but fun it's uh, yeah it's me too great. thank you so, thanks, thanks a lot man.